Um, all right, so we, uh, we're just going to jump right into it. So we've been in a series called what? What is it? Living in the Light. And as we have been living in the light, we've been studying a particular book of the Bible. Uh, is this more of a book or more of a letter? A what? A letter, right? And uh, who's the author of this letter? Was it? John. Which John is the author of this letter? Do you remember? What? What? The apo- What did you say before that? Okay, I was like, man, I'm very confused about what you're saying right now. <laughs> All right. So the Apostle John, right? So not John the Baptist, but, but the Apostle John. And uh, the Apostle John wrote some other letters as well. Anybody know what, what are some of the other books or letters that, that uh, the Apostle John wrote? Second and third John. Okay. And uh, what else? Revelation, right? And there's another one that he wrote. Regular John or the gospel of John, right? So, and then uh, our, our series is going through first John, right? So we've been going through this. Now, if you open your scripture journal and look, we've made it all the way through chapter one. We're into chapter two. And uh, this is like our seventh week studying through it. And there seems to be like, if you just look at the scripture journal, right? Or, or even in, in your regular Bible, you're going to see like, it, it's just kind of like the, the text is just kind of flowing in chapter one. And then as you move to chapter two, uh, on page eight in your scripture journal, you're going to notice that that something starts to change. Today, we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. And uh, and so we're just going to throw this question up there. Like something seems different here in 1 John 2, 12 through 14. What do you notice? Seems like, like you just see it like an actual structural change in the writing. Something's different here. What do you, what do you notice verses 12 through 14? Anybody see anything? Page 8 or 10 in your scripture journal. Does it look the same as everything else around it? Or does, is there something that looks visibly different? Man, I thought this was going to be an easy question. Because it's very obvious that something's different. So uh, what looks different? Nick. Okay, there's some commandments. But like just even structurally, like the sentence looks different, right? What? Yeah, it's like written differently, right? It's like got indents and it like looks more like if you were to, to have a regular Bible and you went to like the book of Psalms, it would look more like Psalm-like or more poetic, right? There's something different here. There's a bunch of indents and there's uh, a broken down uh, like sentences and things like that. And, and so, I don't know, I just thought it like actually looks different than everything else around it. Did you notice that too? Or is that just me? Dana noticed it. He's like, it's very obvious to me um, because the, it's like at the end of verse 11, he's like, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And then it's like shifting, right? Everything seems a little bit different here. And uh, he uses a, a few different words that he repeats. And uh, does anybody notice like who, who is John writing to now? In, the, in this sort of different section, what are some titles uh, of, uh, I guess, some titles that he gives to some of the people that he's writing to here? Do you, do you see what are some of the titles he gives? Children. Okay, we have children. What else do we have? These are not complex questions. Like, literally, if you just look at it, it, you can see. Okay, Bryce? Okay, children and young men and what? Fathers. Okay, so we have these three titles, little children, fathers, and young men. And uh, this is a little bit odd. So is John actually only writing to children and to males? What do you think? You say no. How do you know, Aiden? Just a guess. 50-50 shot. Yeah, Ethan, what about you? Yeah. And it's kind of a generic thing that means everybody, right? So that's an important thing to, to notice as you're reading here is that he's not saying like, hey, this is actually just for the guys and no, no one else, right? That's, that's not to exclude the girls. He's just using like the, this Language that's just inclusive of everybody is what he's saying here. And so he says young men, he says fathers, but ultimately what he's talking about is, is spiritual growth. He, he's not talking about um, like, like actual like men or women or like fathers of like actual children, you know, because that would exclude like most of you in this room. Um, and, and so like he's not just excluding everyone, you know, in this room except for Randy, Matt, me and Dana, right? It's not just like, okay, no one else, this doesn't matter for you. 
right? It, that's not what he's saying here. It actually does matter. And he's talking spiritually about children, about young adults, and about uh, adults, right? So just thinking about it, what, what does that kind of seem to indicate to you? If, if somebody's talking about children, and then maybe young adults, and then adults, like what are, what are some differences between those groups of people? Authority? What do you mean by that? Yeah, that's good. That's good. What else? What are some some differences you notice between children, young adults, and adults? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, they're dependent, right? Yeah. What else? Yeah. Life stages, life experiences are different, right? Okay. What else? Janet? Maturity, right? That's kind of where we're going to get into today. Now, we hope that the older you get, the more mature you are, but we also know that's not the case, right? You ever meet a a little kid who's just an old soul? right? There's just a depth of maturity to them that is just like, it's kind of odd. It's like, wow, there is something more mature about you than than other kids your age, even some adults I know. It's like, I would trust your advice over um, maybe somebody who's like twice your age because there's just like, there's something to that, right? I look at my daughter, Sophie, and she's got an old soul, man. Just the way she speaks, um, the language that she uses is like so far beyond a four-year-old. I'm like, Yes, wise one, like, enlighten me with your wisdom. Like, I don't even know where it comes from in particular. Even her style is just like an old woman. Like, I don't know. It's incredible. Um, so there's a, a maturity, I don't know, like, there's just a difference there, right? And, and so but then we also know people who are, are much, much older and, uh, and, and should have learned the lesson of maturity, and you just know, like, they obviously have not learned that, right? And uh, you see people, we know, I'm not going to give any examples of that in, in my life or anything. Uh, Randy's pointing at himself. Is that, no, I'm just kidding. He's pointing at Matt, but, um, <laughs> oh, he's pointing at Eli. Oh, my bad, my bad. Okay, all right. Just keeps shifting over. Now it's the wall. Um, but we all know that, that maturity and age don't always go together. And, uh, but the idea or the, the hope is that the older you get, the more mature you will be. It's not always a guarantee. But when we think about it spiritually, we, we see two different things here. This is a, a quote from, from a pastor. I forget his name. Um, but he said, spiritually speaking, God's people are at different levels of spiritual maturity. We just know that, right? Here at Pathway, uh, I think Pastor Jeff likes to say, we're all at some, some place along the pathway, right? That's the idea of Pathway Church is, is someone, like every single one of us is somewhere along that pathway. Maybe just beginning the path, maybe not even quite on the path, maybe like way further down the path, maybe just somewhere in the middle of the path. But we're all somewhere along that pathway, right? We're at different levels of spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is a process that often has little to do with physical age. It does not matter how old you are, spiritually speaking, to to determine your spiritual maturity. Now, there is a reality to like more time spent in something ought to mean that you're more mature in something. You have a deeper knowledge and understanding of it and experiential like reasoning behind it and and things like that. But also you could be younger in age than somebody and more spiritually mature than them, right? So you could be like a spiritual adult, but be a young adult, right? Um, And that, that can happen. So this is just something to, to keep in mind, but it, it also doesn't matter like how long you've been in church, right? Some of you have been in church your entire life, but maybe you're still a spiritual infant and, and you haven't really like, like spent time studying the word on your own. And you would say like, like I maybe know a lot of things, but have not really ever applied those things. Or I memorized a lot of verses, but I have no idea what they actually mean. But I've been in church a long time, but you might actually look at your spiritual, spiritual maturity level and say like, 
Actually, like I'm probably more like uh, this little children element or this little children description of a follower of Jesus because like I haven't really put any of it into action, even though I know a lot of the, the scriptures. So when we think about this and we think about like what, what John's trying to get at and, and this, this tiered thing of like little children and young adults and fathers, um, we see that, that really the first blank in your notes is that growth is the path chosen by a fruitful disciple. Growth is the path chosen by a fruitful disciple. It's an intentional decision to get better at something, to grow in your understanding of something, to, to become spiritually mature is a decision that you have to make because growth requires a, a give and take. Growth requires an intentional decision to learn, to spend time getting better at something, to spend time deepening your knowledge in something, to actually spend time in the word of God, to, to be discipled and to live in a, in a disciplined way. It's not something that you just like accidentally fall into, right? You don't become mature by accident. <laughs> you grow into it. Now, physically, you can kind of become mature physically just by accident. You're like, I didn't decide when puberty hit. It just happened, right? And then you're like, okay, your body matured in a different way. Um, but intellectually to mature or emotionally to mature, there are things that you have to learn. There are lessons that you have to cultivate, things that you have to do in order to grow. And so growth is the path chosen by a fruitful disciple. You know, we think of the, the fruit of the Spirit in, in the book of Galatians, and, and we talk about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, like all of those. And somebody who is growing in the fruit of the Spirit is making this intentional decision to grow. And so we're going to see kind of where John leads us in, in this reality of these little children, these young adults, and these fathers. So he says in verse 12, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. So again, who's he writing to here? Little children, okay? And these little children, in, in the hierarchy here that he has of little children, young men, and fathers, where do you think they rank in, in their spiritual maturity? Top, middle, or bottom? Bottom, right? They would be like the least mature, the, the least seasoned in their faith. And so these would be these little children. And, and he's writing to them. And, and what does he specifically tell them? What does he say? Like, I'm writing to you because of something. Because they're forgiven, right? And I think this is something that, uh, you know, Ethan, like you said, like we, we need to become like little children in our faith. I think this is a lesson that we need to remind ourselves of every single day, right? Because when we sin, we are not always the most gracious with ourselves, are we? We're not always the, the kindest or gentlest towards ourselves. And, and then looking at the lives of other people, we, we aren't always the, the kindest or, or most generous in, in our thoughts towards them either. We see what, what somebody else does and we're like, well, hey, at least I'm not that bad. I can't believe they, they did that thing. But this is something that, that all of us need to remember is that we are forgiven. Um, again, one Bible scholar said this. He said, this use of the perfect tense, I'm not a grammar person, but like this is the tense that he uses in this verse, um, conveys the notion that your sins have been once and for all forgiven and will never be brought up before God again. Forgiveness of our sins is the one thing we all have in common. Like this is what is true of somebody who is a follower of Jesus, somebody who's in the family of God, who, who's living in the kingdom of light. This is what it means to walk in the light is that you are forgiven. You take on this new identity that in Christ, this is who you are. And so this is something that John is trying to remind them. And, and if you think about this idea that the repetition is the key to learning, what does that mean? Repetition is the key to learning. What, what do you think it means that, that repetition is the, the key to learning? Thanks for chuckling. I appreciate that. I said it three times in a row on purpose. But what do you think it means that repetition is the key to learning? Yes, Desmond. Right? Probably. I would certainly hope so. And so John here, he's trying to repeat this message that, that we ought to know. So repetition is the key to learning, but sometimes when the same thing is repeated over and over, repetition becomes the key to forgetting. Because you hear the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and you kind of become immune to that thing. 
Right, and I think sometimes, like the more time you spend in church, the more time you spend, uh, like hearing about the Bible and talking about the Bible and reading the Bible. Sometimes these these simple things that that little children need to know and to remember. Sometimes we forget them because we've been so repetitious in it that sometimes the power of it has been forgotten because we've repeated it over and over and over and over and over again, and it becomes something that is just like, oh, you should just know that. You should just know that you're forgiven. Okay, but what if I do this thing? Am I still forgiven? Okay, but what if, what if this? What if I do the same thing again? I said I was never going to do it again. And then I did it again, and I said I was never going to do it again, and then I did it again. Am I still forgiven? Am I still in like walking in the light? Am I still somebody who is saved? Do I still have this relationship with Jesus? Like, like what happens in that context? And, and here's what we can know about one who is in Christ, who has this identity. You can declare, in Christ, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. This is something you can repeat to yourself every day. You can look in the mirror, look yourself in your eyes, which sometimes can be a little bit uncomfortable if you're looking in the mirror, but look yourself in the eyes and say, I am forgiven. Why? Not because of myself, not because I'm perfect, but I am forgiven because I am in Christ. That is who I am. That is the core of my identity. That is, if somebody asks me like who I am, that's the answer that I should give is that I am in Christ because I'm a new creation. And because of that, I am forgiven. So in Christ, I am forgiven. Verse 13. John continues, and now he gets to the next group of people. He, he says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. All right, so there's all three groups here going from father to young men to little children in that progression from most mature to least mature. And uh, what is a defining characteristic of each group? So let's start with father. He says, I'm writing to you fathers because of this reason. Why is he writing to the father or to the fathers, to the the most spiritual mature? Why is he writing to them? If you have your Bible, it's in verse 13. You could just even read the part of the verse right after he says, I'm writing to you fathers because you have done something specific. You have overcome the evil one. Well, is that the fathers or is that the young men? There you go. So we're going to get there, Levi. Hold on to that. I'm going to come back to you. But I'm writing to you fathers because you have, because you, you what? Yes, Lucas. Because you know him who is from the beginning. Now, if we search our memory banks, hopefully repetition has been helpful. But do you remember something about the beginning and something that was significant about John and this word beginning? Do you remember anything in particular about that word beginning in in 1 John 1 or John 1, 1 or anything like that? Who wrote that? Right, John did in John chapter one. So he, he has like a, big, like a big fascination with this word beginning, right? He talks about it in John one. He talks about it in first John one. And there's this, this throwback to Genesis one where like in the beginning, God, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And, and so he's like, hey, in the beginning also was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and then in first John uh, one, one, he talks about uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This is what we proclaim to you. So he says that which was from the beginning, who is the word, who is God, who is the creator. He's, so all this stuff is tied together. And what, what does he say about the fathers in particular? You, you what him from who is from the beginning? You what him? No. You know him, Right. Now, we talked about this knowledge level as well of like, it's not just an intellectual knowledge. It's not just knowing Bible verses. It's not just knowing about God, but it's actually experiential. He's writing to the most spiritually mature and says, you know him who is from the beginning. That's why I'm writing to you because of the depth of your faith and the knowledge that you have of him, this deep knowing that you know about this one who is from the beginning. In in chapter two and verse three, 
It says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Right? We spent some time on that a few weeks back. By this we, we know that we... Uh, I've, sorry, I, this happened last time when I tried to say this to you. By this we know that we have come to know him. And so this knowledge level is deep and experiential. All right, so a defining characteristic of fathers is you know him who is from the beginning. Now what about the young men, Levi? They have overcome the evil one. What in the world does that mean? What does it mean to overcome the evil one? Desmond? They're not led by sin. I like the way you say that, right? Because the scriptures talk about being led by the Holy Spirit. Not, uh, you know, you're walking in step with the Holy Spirit so you don't gratify the desires of your flesh, right? You're being led by the Spirit, not by your sin. So this defining characteristic of, of not the most spiritually mature, but those who are right in the middle, who like have some things figured out. They, they developed a strength of faith and a depth of faith that like holds them. It, it's this foundation that they have been able to build upon and, and their life is really centered around this relationship they have with Christ. They have this deepening relationship that is ongoing and growing because they have this, uh, this knowledge and this time spent with him. And, and because of that, they have overcome this evil one. All right. So there's a defining characteristic of young men. And now what's the defining characteristic of the children at the very end of verse 13? A defining characteristic of them. Yes, Giada. Because you know the Father, right? So this is very similar to the one that he wrote to the fathers, saying, you know him who is from the beginning. And then your rest of the children says, because you know the Father. Right, again, there's this, this knowledge of him, this, this growing understanding of who their heavenly Father is as these little children. So there's this maturity that is happening, this maturity that is taking place, this progression that is deepening in their understanding of, of who God is and, uh, and this spiritual maturity. So the children know the Father, the young men have overcome the evil one, and the fathers know him who is from the beginning. Uh, even a, a deeper level of knowledge than just knowing the Father, but knowing him who is from the beginning, right? This spiritual growth metric. So there's no overcome and no, these defining characteristics. Verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Are we in verse 13? Or is this verse 14? Are you sure? It reads the exact same as verse 13. Repetition is the key to learning, right? John is no fool here. He's like, hey, I'm going to say the same thing because you need to hear it again. And because this is true, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have what? Overcome the evil one. Again, this sounds similar to something that already happened in verse 13, right? He's repeating himself a little bit here, and that's an okay thing. It's good to remind yourselves of this, to remember this. And so he says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So how is it that these young men are strong? I think it's because of the second part that he says. You are strong and the word of God abides in you. I think there's a connection between those two things. If, if we are in this, this maturity and, and growing in our maturity level, then, then what is true of us is that our strength is not our own, but our strength is received from the one who is our strength, the one who is our rock, the one who is our strength in the word of God. And so the word of God is the thing that brings this strength. It's the next blank there on your notes. The word of God brings strength. Is where we draw our strength from. It's where we grow in our knowledge of him who is from the beginning. It's where we continue to, to deepen our knowledge and understanding of who our father is. It's how we overcome the evil one. The word of God brings strength. And if we remember the, the context of why John is writing and, and who he's writing to, he's writing because there's been false teachers that have come in and said something contrary to the gospel. 
And so it's important for them to overcome those things by the word of God. They need to know the word of God so they know that when something is taught, they, they know like, hey, that actually doesn't line up with what the scriptures say. Right? There's this whole history of, of what like, Christians have understood about the scriptures from, from the earliest time of when they were first written to today. And, and now there's like popular teaching today that's like, well, hey, what if actually it means this? It's like, okay, that's cute, but that's maybe not actually what the scriptures were intended to mean. And that might sound nice. That might make you feel good. That might make it like a little bit easier of a message to, to, to like taste or like to, to hear about or whatever it is. It might be a little bit more palatable, but is it true? Is that what the scriptures are actually saying? And so the word of God brings strength because it brings conviction that what we believe is not just something that we made up in a vacuum. <laughs> it's not just something that, that we have developed over, you know, whatever, how many ever years. This is a message that has been true for thousands and thousands of years. And many, 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 many people have tried to disprove the scriptures and have spent much time and many resources trying to say that, that what is said here is not true. And no one has actually been successful at that. And so when we look at the, the truth of the scriptures and, and the, the word of God that we have here, we know that it brings strength. And in his word, we can overcome. We can be like the, the little children go, growing into the young adults, growing into the adults, having this, this word of God that abides in our hearts and in our lives. And by that, we are able to do what John says. In Christ, again, this identity maker, uh, in Christ, we overcome. Again, it's not your willpower. It's not, uh, you know, therapy techniques. It's not these other things. Like, not that those aren't good things, not that those aren't helpful things, but the reality is, is we overcome by the blood of the lamb. We overcome by Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. The only way we overcome is through the word of God as it comes alive in our lives and in our hearts. There's two passages of scripture I wanna share with you and then we're gonna sing a song. The song is Build My Life, and it's this, this declaration of like, hey, this is what I am building the foundation of who I am on. This is what I'm building the foundation of my life upon is, is this relationship with Christ. But these two passages, I think, are very important here as we think about this, this overcoming. We think about the power of, of the word of God in our lives. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, Peter writes, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. Right, there's power in the word of God. There's power in the, in the depth of this relationship with him that allows us to overcome the evil one and to live faithfully in this relationship with him. And then John 15 talks about this idea of abiding and how the word of God needs to abide in us and we abide in Christ. And there's a deep connection here. So John 15, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Right, there's this 
vital connection between abiding in Christ and living in this world. We cannot follow him if we are not constantly, consistently abiding in him. We can't grow into maturity if we're not spending time in the word of God, if we're not spending time at his feet, if we're not cultivating this this relationship, deepening with him, if we're not doing those things on our own, then we're going to be stunted in our growth. We're we're not going to be able to grow to the place of maturity that maybe God would, would try to draw us to as we keep his commandments. And so we want to abide in him. As he abides in us, we want to produce this fruit. And, and we do that. Um, we, we show, he says, uh, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Right? This connection here. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And, and we show right, the, the song Obey. Uh, you know, we, we talk about that a lot. But uh, the, the, the reality that like, we don't obey because we have to, but because of our love for him, there's this desire in us to, to love and obey him. So. I'm going to pray, and uh, as I do, uh, Desmond and Eli, you guys can come up here, and uh, Savannah, you can go back for the slides and all that stuff, and we'll sing this last song and, uh, and then head off to small groups. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time here together and uh, just the opportunity to study your word and, and to talk about what it looks like for us to grow spiritually. Father, I pray that as we head off into small groups, I pray that we would really think deeply about our lives and, and where we are growing and how we are growing and, uh, and maybe where we are in our spiritual maturity and, and how to continue growing in that. Um, Father, we pray that, uh, that we would be, be gracious with ourselves, that we would be kind to ourselves, but also that we would, uh, we, we would challenge ourselves to, to continue growing and learning and, and sharing you with others. And uh, Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen.